And everybody said, Great morning for everyone this morning in Jesus' name. The Lord will bless me. The Lord will open the windows of heaven for me. I will be blessed this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name. We come to you once again today. I will pray, Lord, you fill our empty vessels in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, you touch us at the point we need a touch. You transform our lives at the point we need transformation. I will pray, Lord, that the power of the cross will work in everyone's life without any exception in Jesus' name. Bless our children. Bless our youths. And bless our campus brethren. And bless all of us who are here in Jesus' name. Open the pages of scriptures to everyone. And make us to be partakers of the blessings of the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. In Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 21, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 21, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and the bodies washed by pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful, the promised. We're looking at the conditional promises from our Redeemer, the promises he has given us. And the promises he has made to us. In the last part of that verse 23, it says, He is faithful, the promised. The question then is, why is it so many people lay claim on promises? And those promises are not fulfilled. Why is it many people will say, God gave this promise to me. I've been waiting for years. Other people have prayed on the basis of those promises. And yet, I have not received. And it says, He is faithful. The promised. The major problem with people is that they look at the promises of God without looking at the conditions attached to them. For every promise that God makes from the salvation of the soul unto the glorification of the saint, from our spiritual life to our natural lives, from the spirit and the body, and from everything he has given unto us, you'll discover he gives the promises and attaches conditions to them. And as you look at those conditions, and you follow them graciously, and you follow them faithfully, and you follow them obediently, it's then you'll find that God does not fail, God cannot fail, and God will not fail. It tells us in Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Here it reminds us of the character of God. When he makes a promise, he fulfills the promise. But he attaches conditions to them. Titus chapter 1 verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began the God you cannot lie and the God you cannot fail 
He has given us a promise. And he says, he even gave the promise before the world began. But as in due times manifested his word through the preaching, through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. He saves, he keeps, he heals, he delivers, he sets free. All we will ever need, all you will ever need, from the time you were born into this world, until the time you were born into the kingdom, and until he takes you out of this life, and he moves you on to glory. Everything has been provided. And we come in prayer before the Lord to receive them. And you'll find, if you look at those promises, and you fulfill those conditions, you'll see how God faithfully keeps this word. Second Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. For all the promises of God, all without exception, the ones you know, the ones you are laying claim to, and the ones you are praying that God will fulfill all the promises of God in Him, in Christ, while abiding in Him, while remaining in Him, all the promises of God in Him, that He is you are born again, you have come into the kingdom, and you abide and you remain in the kingdom while you abide in him and his word abides in you he says all the promises he has made they are yes and amen and everything must be understood that you are in him and he tells us at the latter part of that verse that it is to the glory of God by us. Conditional promises from our Redeemer, the one who accepts us, and he brings us into his kingdom. And we faithfully, graciously abide in that kingdom. And so as you look at these promises this morning, and you know that God cannot fail, you're looking at the conditions attached to all those promises, and the Lord faithfully, mercifully, and graciously will fulfill them in your life in Jesus' name. Promises, conditional promises. Promises from our Redeemer. Conditional promises from our Savior. From the faithful one who brought us into the kingdom so that he will do us good. And that goodness of the Lord will be abundant in every one of our lives today in Jesus' name. And I hear a good amen on that side. The three things we're going to consider. Number one, gracious promises for every soul. You cannot say, is there anything there for me? Is there a promise there for me? Has God promised me anything? A man, a woman, a young one, an older one. Has God Promised anything for me. Gracious promises for every soul. And as you come, as you come to the Lord, and you say, Lord, I'm holding on 
to the promise available for everyone. He is no respecter of persons. He will touch your life. He is no respecter of persons. He will change all those things that bother you. And this morning, he will do them in Jesus' name. Gracious promises for every soul. Number two, great promises for his sons. Great promises for his son. We've come into the kingdom. We come into God's family. We come and we're part of the redeemed assembly. Born again. Brought into the kingdom. Sons and daughters of God. The sons of God have peculiar promises that God has made to them. And those great promises... For the spirit, for the soul, and for the body, and for the sufficiency of meeting all our needs. Great promises for his sons. Number three, God's promises for security that he keeps us in the faith persevering unto the end so that as you have come to the Lord he keeps you saved secured and abiding in the inexhaustible grace of God until we see him face to face God's promises for our security number one gracious Promises for every soul. But understand, all these promises have conditions. And as you look at those promises, and you see, that's a condition there. That's a proviso there. That's something there attached to the promise that I need to keep. He in his faithfulness will keep those promises in second chronicles chapter 7 second chronicles chapter 7 reading from verse 14 if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land many times as we read the word of God many people will isolate a part of the word and you do not look at the implication of everything that is said in that verse. My people, verse 14, my people. Now you want you read that. My people, my people. We don't understand. We think those are real, saved, sanctified, favored children of God. But you have to read the whole verse. Because it says, if my people, which are called by my name, outsiders call them by my name. Other nations call them by, by my name. Neighbors call them by my name. They bear what you call a Christian name. And yet... And yet, and yet, although they bear nominal Christian names, as you look at the whole verse, you can tell that these are not the people 
that have their names written in the book of life. And you see, it says, if my people, nominal people, church goers, the people that are called by my name, if they will humble themselves. What does that mean? They're proud. They're proud against the God of heaven. What does that mean? They are proud against the word of God. What does that mean? They are proud against everything that is laid down in the word of God. And it says, if these nominal people called by my name will come down from the ivory tower of pride, humble themselves and pray. What does that mean? They have been prayerless. There are many people called by the name of the Lord. They go to this prophet, pray for me. They go to that mountain, pray for me. They go to that shrine, pray for me. They go to that corner, pray for me. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, Pride is there. And pray, prayerlessness is there. And seek my face. They have been seeking for money. They have been seeking for mundane things of this world. My people, nominal people, nominal Christians, nominal church goers. And then it says, and turn from their wicked ways. They have been wicked. They have been wicked. And they are called my people. And then it says then. What I hear from heaven. You see the if there. That's the condition. If you forget how people see you. How people think about you. My people, my people, my people. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, will pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. That's the condition. There are many people that pray for so many years. And the pride of life is still there. And the pride of possession is still there. And the pride of Appearing to the public as wonderful. It's still there. And there is wickedness in their heart. And the condition is for every soul. If you will humble yourself and pray. And seek the face of the Lord. And turn from your wicked ways. God will hear from heaven. This morning is a morning of prayer. Somebody there said this morning is a morning of prayer. But the condition is. You turn from your wicked ways. You repent and say, Lord, here am I. I'm seeking your face. And the Lord will hear from heaven. He will forgive your sin. Give me a good amen over there. The secret sin that you commit. The secret evil things that you do. He he sees them. And when you become sincere before the Lord, He lays a condition there and He says, He will forgive. And then He will heal our land. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. I'm reading from verse 6 and verse 7. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6 Seek ye the Lord while he may be found Call upon him while he is near Let the wicked forsake his way You see the Lord does not gloss over sin Does not gloss over wickedness He says that the wicked Forsake his way, and God does not have 
favorites. He sees wickedness there. He sees atro atrocities there. He sees iniquity there. And he says, let the wicked forsake his way. And the righteous man, his thoughts. Stop there for a moment. Unrighteous man. Many times we think of the actions of sin. We think of the acts of sin. But God looks at the heart. And as God looks at the heart, he sees the thoughts of sinning. The thoughts of evil. The thoughts of iniquity. The thoughts of cruelty. The thoughts of worldly pleasure. The thoughts, the plan. He says, let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, not only the acts of unrighteousness, let him forsake his thoughts. And then he goes on to say, and let him return unto the Lord. Not just return to the church. There are many people that return to the church. They do not return to the Lord. There are many people that return to the assembly. They do not return to the Lord. It says, you forsake your ways, you forsake your thoughts, and then you return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him. Mercy upon him. I said mercy upon him. And let him return to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. How does he pardon? Who does he pardon? He battles the people that turn away from sin, that return from the wilderness of sin, and they come to the Lord. They seek his pardon. They seek his forgiveness. And then because they repent, because they turn away from evil, they fulfill that condition. If they are backsliding, they accept their backsliders. And they return to the Lord from their backsliding. And the Lord will have mercy upon them. That mercy will come to you this morning. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 18. Isaiah 1 verse 18. Come now. And let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, but you must come. Though your sins be as scarlet, but you must come now. Though your sins be as scarlet, it says they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson. They shall be as wool. It's talking about salvation. It's talking about cleansing. It's talking about forgiveness. It's talking about conversion. It's talking about a change of life. But it says, you must come. You come out of the darkness. You come out of the evil. And you come now, urgently. It says, verse 19, here is the condition. If you be willing, and obedient, he shall eat the good of the land. But if he refuse and rebel, but if he refuse and rebel, coming to church, if he refuse and rebel, called by the name of the Lord, if he refuse and rebel, Standing to be a Christian, professing to be a Christian. If you refuse and rebel, you rebel against the word of the Almighty. If you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured, destroyed, devastated with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It tells us then that 
as we come to claim the promises of the Lord, we stand on those promises, keeping to the condition of the promise. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. But Christ, as a son over his house, whose house are we? Don't rejoice yet. Whose house are we? Don't conclude yet. Whose house are we? Don't jump yet. Whose house are we? If, if, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. You see the condition there. We are his house. We are his temple. We are his people on one condition. If we hold fast the condition of our faith, the confidence of our faith to the very end. Wherefore, verse 7, as the Holy Ghost says, today, if ye will hear his voice, had he not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works forty years wherefore i was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their hearts and they have not known my way, so I swear in my wrath. They shall not enter into my rest. Take it, brethren, your saved. Take it, brethren. You're a member of the body of Christ. Take it, my brethren. It says, take it, my brethren. Take it, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You know, there are people that tell us that once you are in, you're always in. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Once you're born again, you're always born again. Once you're a child, you're always a child. You know, those people are not, they do not reason very well. You know what? Everybody was a child of the devil. Everybody was a son of Satan. Jesus said, ye are of your father, the devil. If what they say is true, once a child, always a child. That means everybody will be forever lost. But it's not true. Because you are a child of the devil, a son of Satan. But by looking at the call to the gospel and the call to salvation, you turned away from sin and you came to the Lord. And you are a son of Satan, a child of the devil. Now there's a change. You're not a child of God. Once a son, always a son, is not true. Look at that verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you, any of you means anyone. There's some people that, you know, they get to the top level and they say, me, whatever I do, it's like they have a special pact with the Lord. Doesn't matter. Because this is me. Others may not have that special, peculiar privilege. But here is me. Here am I. Whatever I do, I still get to heaven. No, you probably will be in the hottest part of hell. Because you're taking the grace of God. 
You're taking the mercy of God. You're taking the goodness of God for granted. That's why it says, take it, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ. Hold on. We are made partakers of Christ. Read everything. For we are made partakers of Christ. What's the next word there? Tell me out loud. Tell me. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. If, if we don't hold it fast unto the end, you'll be lost. Point number two. Great promises for his sons. Great promises for his sons. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're reading here from verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. He's talking to his sons. He's talking to the family of God. Don't walk by the principle of the unbeliever. Don't go into the practice of the unbeliever. Don't act the same way as the unbelievers act. Don't be joined in the manner of your life with the life of the unbelievers. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Those children of Israel understood when they were going to plow their fields, they'll yoke two animals together and they'll be pulling the plow so that the yoked animals will come together, who are kept together. The animals that are yoked together, those animals that are tied together, they'll plow the same field. He's saying that if you're going to have the heritage of sons, you're going to have the inheritance of the sons. You're going to have the promise of the Heavenly Father for the family. You as a son of God, as a daughter of God, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Ah, that unbeliever may be of the same father, the same mother with you. Don't be unequally yoked together with him. That unbeliever may be of the same mother with you. Don't be unequally yoked together with her. We are establishing this together. We are doing this together. We are yoked and joined together in this. She's my mother's daughter. Uh -huh. But unbeliever. She is my father's son. Uh -huh. But unbeliever. Unbeliever is unbeliever. Those are idol worshippers. Those are cultic people. Those are sinful people. Those are rebellious people. Those are unconverted, unsaved, unrighteous people. Be not unequally yoked together. With unbelievers. People think that's only in marriage. Of course, of course, of course. You'll not marry an unbeliever. If you do, you are backsliding. 
But it's not only your marriage. In business. In pattern of life. In the project you make. It says be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness. You are righteous. He is unrighteous. What fellowship do you have together? What communion has light with darkness? You are in the light. He is in darkness. What communion of you together? Verse 15. What concord has Christ with Belial? You belong to Christ. He belongs to Belial, to Satan. What communion do you have together? What concord? What agreement? What part? As he that believeth with an infidel. Infidel unbeliever. Infidel a wicked man, a wicked woman, infidel, somebody not in the kingdom of God. It says, what agreement as a temple of God with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. Ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Look at the conditional. Wherefore. Tell me the next two words there. Tell me out loud. Now since you've been attending retreats. Have you looked at your life? Have you checked your life? Have you seen what God is demanding from you? You come to the retreat. You go through the retreat, you finish the retreat, and that unequal yoke is still there in business. Did you ever think of coming out? You're a nominal retreat person. You don't have the mind of fulfilling the condition attached to the word of God. The associations you have. The affiliations you have. And the societies you belong to. Have you ever thought of coming out? I'm born again, I'm born again. Uh -uh. The Bible does not accept that. The Bible says, wherefore, come out. From among them, and be ye, also what then? And be ye, tell me the word, be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I, shall, I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons. And my daughters, says the Lord, ye shall be my sons and my daughters on the condition that you come out, come out of sin, come out of wickedness, come out of evil, and be ye separate. He says, that's the condition. And then he'll fulfill the promise of God in your life. And I will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons. And my daughter says the Lord. We're looking at um, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 12. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. Here it says in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved... As ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation of fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation of fear and trembling. Look at the beginning of the verse. Wherefore, 
my beloved. Those are believers. Wherefore, my beloved, those are cherished sons and daughters in the kingdom. And yet it says, walk out your own salvation of fear and trembling. The people that tell us that there's no fear of being lost, there's no fear of backsliding, there's no fear of going to hell. You're saved. You're born again forever. You're saved. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Read your Bible. Beloved brethren, work out your salvation of fear and trembling. If there is no danger of being lost after you are saved, if you become careless and you slide back into sin, and you dive back into sin. And you emerge yourself, immerse yourself in sinning. If there's no fear of being lost, why did he say, work out your own salvation? For fear and trembling, then he goes on to say, for it is, for it is God which worketh in you. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without tell me I can't hear you how many things should you do without murmuring tell me tell me all things you're working for the Lord and the church do all things without murmurings and disputing you're doing something at the retreat. Do all things without murmurings and disputing. That she may be. That she may be blameless and harmless sons of God. They were without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain not labored in vain you see the condition he attaches to that if we are going to remain sons of God great promises he gives us for the end conditions. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. Revelation 21, verse 7. He that overcometh, that's the condition, that's the condition, that's the condition. He that overcometh, you overcome temptation. Temptations will come to you to act like a sinner. To do what the sinners do. To drink what the sinners drink. Temptation will come to you. To marry as sinners marry. Temptations will come. To go the way of sinners. But the condition is. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be as God, and he shall be my sons. Number one, gracious promises for every soul. Those promises have conditions. Number two, great promises for his sons. Those promises have conditions. Number three, God's promises for our security. God's promises for the believer's security. The believer's security is conditional. Matthew chapter 24. Verses 12 and 13. Matthew chapter 24 verse 12. And because iniquity 
shall about the love of many shall wax cold the lord is talking about the time near his return and he says because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold you'll see people around you here and there iniquity abounds around you and because of that the love of many waxing cold verse 13 but he that shall endure to the end the same shall be saved he that shall endure to the end the same shall be saved you see the condition there i'm a believer praise the lord are you enduring are you enduring to the end are you standing standing on the watch of his righteousness and unto the end only those who be saved luke chapter 9 verse 62 and jesus said unto him no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back his feet for the kingdom of god you understand that a man comes and he puts his hands on the plow when you put your hand on the plow you look straight ahead of you and your plow is straight line if you're looking back you're not looking the direction you're going the direction of heaven and no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom in which way are you looking back to the world you come here to collect healing but your mind is over there in the world you come here to collect miracle but your mind is over there in the world you come here to collect blessing but you put your hand on the plow and you're looking back no christian life no christian commitment and no christian dedication or devotion you are not looking at the word of god and you are not going the direction of heaven only healing miracle to be collected but then you are not following the way of the lord and no man that's talking about you there no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom the lord is coming and i will be in the kingdom somebody there i said i will be in the kingdom you know what it takes to take your eyes away from those women in the world to take your mind away from that promise of occultic people in the world and look straight looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith luke chapter 17 in luke chapter 17 verse 32 remember lord's wife those, those are the words of jesus how do you remember of lord's wife no man no woman having put his son her hand on the plow and looking back is feet for the kingdom go to the mountain top look not behind thee escape from this judgment coming lord's wife had too much in sodom too many friends in Sodom. Too much attachment to Sodom. 
and too much association in Sodom. And she saw those angels, and the angels laid hold on them, escaped to the mountain. Don't look back. She looked back and became what? A pillar of salt. And that's what the Lord is saying. He says, remember, Lord's wife, God's promises for our security. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 20 For if after they have escaped Lord's why if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ those are saved people those are converted people. These are children of God. They escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at this. They, if they are again entangled therein, they were saved. If they were, if they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. The one who escaped the kingdom of darkness, escaped the lifestyle of sinning. Through the knowledge of the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Then he backslides. He goes back to those things. If you die in that condition, the last edge is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. It would have been better they were not even saved to start with than after they have known it, after they were saved, to turn from that holy commandment delivered unto them. But it is happened unto them. According to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the soul, the swine, the pig that was washed to our wallowing in the mire. The Lord is saying that you need to come back to the faith. You need to be kept in the faith. You need to keep on holding on. Holding on till the very end. If that eternal abode of the saints is going to be yours. Galatians chapter 2. Verse 18, Galatians chapter 2, verse 18. For if I build again the things which I was destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. When you became a Christian, when you became born again, when you repented of your sins, you destroyed the bridge that connected you to the world. You burnt the bridge that connected you to occultic powers. You burnt the bridge that connected you to the old sin partner. I am born again. I'm a child of God. I burn the bridge connecting me to anything and everything in the world. Are you building those bridges back? Because if I build again the things which I once destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. But you come to live now in newness of life. Say, Christ is mine. His salvation is mine. His goodness is mine. 
I'm crucified with Christ. Verse 20. Nevertheless, I live. I am crucified with Christ. I don't have any business building the old bridge I've destroyed. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. Satan will not live in you. Demons will not live in you. Corruption will not live in you. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He says, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live by the faith of the Son of God. I live that by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Lord is calling you this morning not for healing, not for deliverance, not for all this bread and butter. The Lord is calling you to re-examine re -examine your life and find out are you still in the faith? Because, 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 if all you get is healing, if all you get is blessing, bread and butter, and you lose your soul for eternity, you'll be wondering, why did I behave in such a foolish way? He's giving us promises, promises for salvation, and promises for holiness, and promises for sanctification and promises for obedience and promises for righteousness and he wants us to abide in those promises and he says he that shall endure to the end the same shall be saved we're going to rise up and pray and say lord give me the grace grant me the grace i want to abide to the very end, the promises of God are conditional. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will pray, will seek my face, and will turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will heal their land. I will forgive their sin. Remember, you need the grace to abide. Unto the very end. Open your mouth, open your mouth, pray unto the Lord.